Good morning from London. I'm Anna Edwards alongside Guy Johnson and Chrissy Gupta. We're an hour away from the opening trade. Here's what you need to know. It's Election Day USA, following one of the most dramatic presidential campaigns in U.S. history. Kamala Harris and Donald Trump have been making their last-minute pitches to swing voters in Pennsylvania and in Michigan. The dollar steadies, with traders bracing for volatility from a tight election result. Asian stocks climb after China's services activity grows more than expected. Plus, Boeing workers vote to accept a new wage deal and end a crippling strike, clearing the way for the playmaker to resume manufacturing. In the meantime, quick check on these markets here. When you're looking at the futures picture, not much to see, but it feels like that calm, that eerie calm we're seeing in the markets is the story. Perhaps preparing for some of that volatility we're expecting throughout the end of the week. Eurostox 50 futures flat, FTSE 100 down by one tenth of 1%. We're looking at a 10 year that's at 429 right now, and a dollar that is a little bit weaker this morning, perhaps in retaliation to what you're seeing, or a continuation, I should say, to what you're seeing in yesterday's session. 710 against the yuan. The countdown to the opening trade starts right now. Tuesday, the 5th of November. It is finally here. The Americans are voting in person across the country. Are we going to see fireworks, Chrissy? This is the key question today. Are we going to see fireworks? How is this going to play out? It feels incredibly tight. The world is holding its breath. It's Election Day in America, and the, both candidates are campaigning until the very last minute. You are seeing that even right now, Donald Trump making comments in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I mean, this is enormous here because the whole world, mm. dare I say it, could change. It's in very late. Four hours. Very late. It's like, <laughs> I think it's 2 a.m. or it must be 1 a.m., I guess, in, in, in Michigan Central Time. But look, I think this is crucial here because they really are, and I think it's, it shouldn't be missed, campaigning to the last minute in some of those swing states. Michigan, of course, being a crucial one up there, very determined by the auto story, similar to one that we see here in Europe as well. This idea that a lot of the labor uh, kind of uh, community there that has, by the way, uh, the auto unions have largely endorsed Kamala Harris. Trump still trying to make inroads with that community. Mm, yes, we see both of them going back to places that seem to matter to them and make a difference to them, have some sort of sentimental meaning through the campaign, both Trump and Harris, uh, then campaigning right down to the, to, to the final moments. In terms of what this means for, for markets, you know, the Markets Live team have been doing a pulse survey. It uh, tells us things that we might have expected about what a Trump would m uh, win would mean. Uh, investors are expecting that that would be positive initially for stocks and for Bitcoin. Gridlock would be the best result for stocks, according to that survey, which does fit with some of the conversations yeah. that we've been having with investors. There's various permutations, isn't there? So you've got a red sweep. What does that mean for stocks? What does yeah. that mean for the bond market? What does it mean for the dollar? You've got a Trump win with gridlock. Is that the best outcome for all assets cumulatively? Then you've got a Harris win with gridlock. The various permutations, and it's really hard to tell at this point in time which asset's going to move mm. and how they're going to move. How does gold move? How does the dollar move? Yeah. What does equity, what does the equity market do? It's going to be fascinating. I think we're going to see various gyrations over the next 24, 48 hours. Various gyrations and various time periods here because we get results as early as Wednesday afternoon yep. or as late as this weekend. And that kind of volatility that we're expecting to see in between as the results start to come in. We showed some of the swing states that we're keeping an eye on. Everyone's mm. on a knife. Uh, and, and Mark Cudmore of the Markets Live blog saying to us yesterday that the feeling in Asia, they might know enough by early our time here in Europe yep. tomorrow to start placing bets. That's not to say final results will have been revealed, but they might know enough. We'll be looking for all those clues. I want to go to the far side of America. I want to go to what is happening in the Pacific Northwest. Boeing, its workers have now accepted a deal that has been put forward by the company. A 38% pay increase over four years is the deal that's been put on the table and accepted. A couple of things to say here, I think. One of which is only 59% of voters uh, of workers voted for the deal, which is interesting because in some ways, culturally, this company needs to have its workers on board with the idea that it's going to go forward from here and it needs to get the culture right from here. So yeah. are all workers on board? 60% roughly are, 40% potentially aren't. The other thing is it's going to take a long time to restart. So not only is it going to take a long time to restart the Boeing plants, then the whole supply chain issue. The supply chain has been hit really hard by this strike. It's going to take a long time to spin that back up again. And that could take months mm. to get going again. And that's only the first order of business, which, of course, is really important. But then that just takes us back to kind of where we started, with all the culture change and the other yeah. big change, change projects that need to happen yeah. at, that, at that business to make it you know, fit, to, to, fit for that's the why, industry it operates in. That's why the, the, the kind of the vote is really important, I think. 
everybody needs to be on board with this. Everybody needs to be pulling in the same direction. Is everybody happy with this deal? Mm. Yeah. I just wonder, looking at the vote count. Well, I think we should just remind our international audience that this is a contract that has a 38% wage increase. It's yep. the largest wage increase in all of the labor negotiations happening with some of the major corporates in the United States. Uh, and to your point, that 59% vote. But a 38% wage increase at a time when we're still kind of talking about that battle of inflation and a potential tick higher in going into next year when it comes to those numbers, this could show up in that. It could. It's going to be, I think it will definitely show up in the data, mm. and that's going to be really interesting as well to watch. Talking of data, China. Yeah, absolutely. Let's go to the China story, because we had services data out that's come in ahead of expectations. So this is the Tai Xin measure, so uh, not the sort of official measure of the Chinese yeah. economy, uh, but one that many economists do watch. It's coming at 52. Remember, 50 being uh, the, the, the line that dictates expansion. So 52, it's in expansion territory, and the estimate was only 50.5. And some economists are pointing to this as early evidence that at least in terms of enough sentiment to get people out spending, there has been some impact from some of the policy changes we saw announced by Beijing. Uh, it, it, for example, one economist citing the replacement initiative, you know, you get uh, help replacing uh, appliances, for example. Does this mean that they managed to meet their 5% growth target? Well, m economists do seem to be on board with that. But yep. the crucial thing hanging over China and the growth story there has to be the tariffs and, and linking back to where we started, the US election. 60% tariff mm -hmm. on, on Chinese exports, that's going to be, that's going to be, a, that would be a game changer. So I think you saw some of this yesterday. So today you see equity markets rallying quite strongly in China, but there was a hint of it towards the back end of the session yesterday. We did see a rally begin, and I wonder whether that was an indication maybe that actually this rally is based on the idea that Harris is doing better than Trump, and actually it's a combination today of the Harris-Trump story plus also the data that we're getting out of China plus also the stronger line mm. from the government. And you're absolutely seeing that show up in, in dollar yuan, for example. Is that the data or is that the, to your point, the election odds that are showing up in the currency picture? But you are starting to see strength in the Chinese yuan, of course, as we await the NPC throughout the rest of the week. Absolutely. So with all of that in mind, let's get an update from Bloomberg's chief North Asia correspondent, Stephen Engel, who is at the China International Import Expo in Shanghai. So tariffs, I'm sure, certainly very much uh, in focus there as you talk about imports and exports, Stephen. Uh, so what are the yeah. latest lines coming out from the NPC yeah. meeting? Let's start there. Yeah, the NPC Standing Committee is meeting behind closed doors starting yesterday through Friday. We're expecting some sort of announcement by Friday on some fiscal stimulus numbers. Already we're hearing through the state media uh, that they are discussing a debt swap program to sweep out a, a lot or swap out, excuse me, a lot of this hidden debt at the local government level through the local government financing vehicles. The IMF uh, estimates that could be upwards of 60 trillion yuan, 8.5 trillion U.S. dollars worth of hidden debt at the local level in China. Now, the swap program is not going to be that large, but we're hearing it could be anywhere between 6 to 10 trillion yuan to kind of free up some cash for the local governments to go and spend it where they really need to, in government or local employees' salaries, in construction costs. Obviously, all across China been hit hard by COVID zero and the after effects of that and the spending they had to do. It's drained their fiscal coffers. And then again, the property crisis has drained their coffers as well and reduced their, their, their spending power. So that is good. And that feeds into the narrative that investors are looking for. And that is, will we get a big number of fiscal stimulus at the end of the week that could help with the other issues in China, help boost consumer spending, help uh, recapitalize the banks and, and essentially, you know, give that lift uh, if the stimulus that we saw in late September is starting to uh, wane a little bit, even though those numbers you guys just talked about is kind of the after effect of that swath of stimulus that we got in late September. Thanks for the update. Always appreciate it, Stephen. Bloomberg's chief North Asia correspondent, Stephen Engel, uh, joining us at the International Import Expo at, in Shanghai. Let's talk about what we've got coming up in the rest of the show shortly. Mira Chandan, uh, co-head of Global FX Strategy at JP Morgan, uh, is going to be joining us. How is the dollar going to react? What's going to be happening with the yen? Which currencies are going to be moving the most on the back of this election result? Emmanuel Cow, head of European Equity Strategy at Barclays, is going to be joining us around the open. Uh, we're going to have a preview of this U.S. election. What should we be watching out for? What are the critical impacts that this election are going to have? Peter Trubovitz from the London School of Economics is going to be joining us a little bit later on. Let's talk about... 
uh, what else we've got on the show as well that you need to be knowing about this morning. Uh, Bloomberg has learned that OpenAI is having discussions with California regulators on advancing its bid to transform into a for-profit business. We're told the $157 billion company is in early talks with the Attorney General's office about the process. It's likely to involve scrutiny of how OpenAI values its portfolio of intellectual property, including the ChatGPT app. Palantir shares have soared in late trade after it posted record profits and quarterly revenues, the beat analyst estimates. CEO Alex Karp telling shareholders that Palantir is meeting a, quote, unwavering demand for what he calls a US-driven AI revolution. And in the aftermath of floods that have killed over 200 people in Spain, King Felipe has warned angry residents about misinformation and false claims circulating on social media. The king says, quote, there is a lot of information poisoning, adding that instigators were attempting to use social media to create chaos. So we have seen the storm moving northwards up towards Barcelona. I think that caused a significant amount of flooding yesterday, Critty. Today, it looks like that is beginning maybe to fade. Uh, but we did see clo closures of schools yesterday. There's been significant flood in the airport. Uh, saw some closures during the day as well. Hopefully, it looks like today the weather has improved. Yeah, and, and I believe the Catalonia government as well saying that those intense storms have indeed finished, as you were, you were pointing out. But this really comes back down to the way the infrastructure is, is really set up in Spain. And I think Rodrigo Orihuela, our Madrid bureau chief last week, was really explaining that there is a fundamental issue in Spain in terms of what infrastructure, whether it's weather alerts, whether it's airports, et cetera, that kind of funding is under the control of the federal government versus the state government. And that's really where you're starting to see a lot of the pushback, that when the need is or when the alerts are sent out or when the actual need for kind of disaster aid is there, who is at the end of the day responsible for it? And it seems like right now the federal government mm. getting a lot of the flack. Yes, and he was he was talking us through that, wasn't he, last week? And talking through, yeah, who's responsible for which alerts, when, and where the disappointment should fall. Um, of course, people just look around at times like this for somebody to blame, whether they were in the wrong or not. And what we seem to be, with these warnings from the king about misinformation, yep. we seem to see this, you know, this uh, powerful cocktail of genuine worries, genuine fear, genuine anxiety and criticism mixed in with special interest groups, extremist agendas and the like. And, 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 yeah, and it, and it all gets very political very quickly. Is this going to show up in the economic data? At what point does this show up in the economic data? Yeah. Taking a kind of step back from what we're seeing on the ground yeah. and the Is it really jars with the economic story at it the does, moment, which is so yeah. positive for Spain compared to the rest of Europe? In some ways, it comes at the end of the summer season which would have been very much affected by this. Obviously, the weather has changed and changed quite significantly. Yeah. But I do wonder at what point we're going to see this showing up in the, in the data and whether that has a, a bigger effect mm. in terms of how policy is directed in Europe. OK, uh, 7.12 here in London, 8.12 uh, if you're watching in Paris, Frankfurt or, uh, or Madrid. Let us move on to some of the other corporate news flow that we have this morning. Uh, the UK could approve Vodafone's three deal if the business agrees to enact remedies. The Competition and uh, Markets Authority, so the CMA, has provisioned found this and um, we get this announcement this morning that Vodafone and 3 could address competition concerns through network investment and customer protections and so they make the point that there could be the approval in the offing if they meet with those requirements. Regulators are seeking feedback before making a final decision on December the 7th. Coming up on the programme we'll bring you more on that Boeing story after the plane makers largest union votes to accept a wage deal ending a long-running strike that's crippled manufacturing. Plus a Danish wind turbine maker Vestat sees earnings for the full year at the lower end of the expected range. We'll be joined by the CEO, Henrik Andersen. That's at 8.30 London time. Up next, Lazard's chief market strategist, Ronald Temple, will be joining us to talk about the markets. If you have any questions, if you want to get involved in these conversations, um, please do get in touch with us. IB plus BBTV is the function to use. And it was the uh, EBIT margin that we were talking about there with regard to Vesta. So we'll come back. We'll circle back to that conversation shortly. This is Bloomberg. are pro-growth. Trump, I think most people think he will try to extend the tax cuts and, uh, you know, lower corporate tax rates. We also have to keep an eye on the long end of the bond market in the United States. The fiscal situation is rather challenging. Uh, and so Harris stands for less uh, a fiscal imprudence, so to speak. So, you know, I, I think neither of them are particularly bad. Both are pro-growth. Mm. Uh, and I wouldn't say that only Trump is going to be good for the market.
Alfie Tiedemann's global, global Nancy Curtin speaking to this program yesterday. Sounding quite positive on both candidates in terms of the growth aspect of the story that we potentially could see coming out of the United States. So is the logic of that trade basically, regardless of who wins, you buy socks, sell, sell bonds? Ron Temple, chief market strategist at Lazar, sitting around the table with us this election day. Good morning. Good morning. Is that the logic? Regardless of the outcome, do I buy stocks and sell bonds? Well, I don't know if it's that simple. I think the short-term yep. reaction versus the long-term might be two different topics. But I do think if you get a Trump victory, we could easily see the stock market rally in the immediate aftermath. Yep. People focused on lower corporate tax rates, less regulatory oversight of the energy sector, financial services. So I think you could have a range of outcomes across sectors. In the Kamala Harris victory, basically, I think what people should focus on is she's is an 80 percent chance she'll have a Republican Senate. So really, you don't get material change in policy under Harris. And to me, that's a positive outlook. So it kind of aligns with what you just said. Yep. U.S. economy has been growing above potential. It's been growing two and a half percent per annum for two years. You know, that's a good environment. Fed cuts rates under Harris. The big issue under Trump is I think the market is underpricing the risk of a trade war and the protectionist measures he's talked about. Yep. And that could derail the story. So you, you get an initial sugar high with a Trump victory and potentially a red sweep. The setup into this story is very different to when we went into Trump 1.0. Trump 2.0 could look very different. So I'm wondering how quickly that sugar high face. We were at 16 times earnings when we went into Trump 1. Going into Trump 2, we're at 22 times earnings. That's a significant difference. Right. We were set up in an economy that basically can take maybe a reflationary trade into 1.0. 2.0, it feels very different as well. The market's therefore probably going to price some more sort of higher term premium at the back end of the bond market. How different is, is the setup? How quickly could the sugar high fade? Well, I was trying to think just now is what was the debt to GDP back when Trump got elected? Very different. Public debt to GDP, I'm guessing, would have been 75 yeah. percent, something like that, as opposed to over 100 percent now. So I think you might get a more immediate bond market reaction, which we've already seen in the run up to this yep. as Trump's probability of victory went up. Bond yields went up, which I think which I think is the right trade. We should probably expect to see dollar strengthening if Trump wins. But within the equity market, I'm just thinking back in 2016, the big winners in the immediate aftermath were financial services, energy, industrials, materials. Now, I think this time you would have financials and energy win because if you look at it, lower corporate tax rate, positive. Less regulation, positive. Tariffs, irrelevant. They don't import anything into the U.S., right? So somewhat immune to the trade policy. What I think will be missing this time is industrials and materials. Last time they rallied because people thought there would be a big infrastructure program. That's not even been discussed from the Trump campaign this time. If anything, I think the losers this time are probably consumer discretionary, maybe tech hardware because of exposure to China, and maybe industrials because of so much of their content, their inputs come from these countries that might be subject to tariffs. So it, it's a difficult story. How long for the sugar high to wear off? My crystal ball is a little cloudy <laughs> on that one. When it, when it comes to some of the other kind of asset plays, though, I'm thinking oil, for example, mm. or I'm thinking uh, we already talked about the bond market, even the dollar. How much of that foreign policy story is really the driver when it comes mm. to that? And is almost maybe the Achilles heel of some of the economic resilience that we're seeing in the states. Well, it's interesting that you bring up the foreign policy because I tend to think markets do not price geopolitics yeah. until they're forced to. Think about Russia, Ukraine. The yeah. U.S. warned for months. When the invasion happened, the markets priced it. Um, in this case... I think what we're talking about is potentially a reshaping of the geopolitical landscape for years to come if the U.S. were to, and again, I'm focusing on the Trump victory possibility, if the U.S. were to cut off aid to Ukraine, if the U.S. commitment to NATO diminishes, I think that raises the risk of all European assets, but it also has a risk factor in Asia. You know, if the U.S. is not as committed to NATO, What's Beijing supposed to read into that? What yeah. does that mean in terms of Taiwan? And so, so I think those are all issues. Back to energy and oil, I think what's interesting there, back to the sugar high question as well, connecting the two, I think energy stocks immediately would rally on a Trump victory because of less regulation, fewer environmental yeah. constraints. But keep in mind, more drilling on federal land means more supply of the commodity. And you've already got forecasts that there could be an even bigger energy glut next year. Mm -hmm. So there might be a positive on margins, a negative on commodity price. Again, there are going to be a lot of moving parts for people to juggle in the next few days. So aside from the kind of long vol trade, which has been the consensus mm -hmm. that people come in, in into the show, at least for the next seven days or so, what is the other hedge here? At a time when, to your point, oil seems like a, a almost negative bias kind of story. The bond market is iffy given the Fed. The dollar is doing its own thing. What's the hedge? 
I wish I had a good answer for that. <laughs> There's not an easy Come hedge. On, Ron. <laughs> Again, we're talking about something we're going to know in 24 hours, so it's probably a little late to be hedging at this point anyway. What I would suggest people do is think about what are the opportunities that could come out of this? What might you be able to put on your books after we know the results? Again, because it's so late in the game here. And I look at it and say, if you do have a Trump victory, it's probably going to be a Republican sweep. I would expect a Republican Senate and a House in that scenario. And I would say under Harris, you probably get a Republican Senate, 80% chance, but a Democratic House. So in a divided government, uh, basically status quo with Kamala Harris, I do think there are a range of markets that could do well. I like emerging markets long term. I think Japan is still poised to do well. And again, if you avoid that trade war, those non-U.S. markets could be a good place to put your capital. I also think small cap could be a good place to be because lower interest rates, better for small cap. They have a lot more debt and a lot of its floating rate. In the Trump scenario, I would expect over time, it might not be in the first week, you probably get a sell-off in non-U.S. markets because of the fears around trade policy. EM would be negatively affected, especially China would be negatively affected. Mm. Um, other markets like Europe could be negatively affected. That might be your buying opportunity for some of these markets. And in particular, I look at EMX China. Trump is negative for China. Let's make no mistake. Harris, to some degree, is negative for China. That's the one bipartisan topic in D.C., but what I think is going to happen over the next decade is we're going to see a lot of capital being moved out of China into other emerging markets to try to de-risk that geopolitical setup. Yeah. And that could be positive. Uh, and, and Ron, yes, and you paint this picture, you know, there have been plenty of attempts to um, add optionality to reliance on China, haven't there? Lots of multinationals mm -hmm. trying to find other places to produce. And, and so we go from this picture where you rely on China to you rely on lots of other emerging market countries, perhaps. Um, is that something that you think investors are fully aware of? Is that, is that something that investors can access as an investment theme? I think you can definitely access it. We've seen quite a few firms launching EMX China strategies, for example. That might be one approach. The other might be you can try to choose your country, right? Mm. There's a lot of enthusiasm around India, a lot of enthusiasm around other individual countries. My bias would be don't try to pick a single country because I think a lot of countries are going to be a winner from this tension. Uh, we recently published a report on global supply chains with our geopolitical advisory team where we looked at India, Vietnam, Thailand, Mexico, Poland, each of them has specific advantages and disadvantages. So mm. I think it's going to be a China plus many solution, not yeah. a China plus one. And that's an opportunity for investors. If we think about the possibility of a Trump victory, it doesn't sound as if you're using Trump 1.0 as, a, as, a, as a, a template for what happens here. That you've talked about some of the differences in the way the markets are positioned going into if we end up with a Trump 2.0. But also the, his ability to maybe enact policy mm -hmm. might be greater this time around, do you think? Yeah, I think... Um, to use the reference, you might want to turn, uh, turn the volume up to 11 and a turn 2.0 because I think the constraints are going to be limited. Um, if you think back, he had Gary Cohen, he had Rex Tillerson. A lot of the people around him were more institutionalist Republicans. I don't think many people expect that in a second term if Trump wins. I also think when, the reason I emphasize trade so much, Congress isn't involved. The president has a lot of flexibility. It's not just Section 301 and 232. There are a whole list of legal yeah. codes that allow the president to act. So I think he felt in many ways constrained in his first term, felt he didn't get all of his agenda put in place. Second term, he's not going to make that mistake again. All right. Ron Temple, chief market strategist over at Lazar, joining us around the table this morning, kind of mapping out what some of those election scenarios may look like. We'll see if he's right in just maybe 24 hours and counting. Coming up on the program, we continue that conversation and zero in on the FX trade, where volatility is surging ahead of the U.S. election. We'll bring me again, mapping out the different outcomes that could mean for some of the most exposed currencies, the yuan, the euro, the peso. We're all over it. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to the opening trade, everybody. It is Election Day in the United States. And so this is the picture that we have for you in terms of where futures are right now. Uh, the futures picture is flat. It's not moving. And uh, that might be to be expected. That might be entirely as we would have foreseen because, of course, we're waiting for a little bit of clarity around one of the most important consequential decisions of the year around the U.S. election. So that's where we are on futures. Uh, let's have a look at the bond markets. Also there, we are seeing very modest moves, a slight tick up in yields across European bond markets. I see this morning the same over in the United States, but really nothing uh, very material. Let's get to Chrissy, who has FX on her mind and volatility. Chrissy? Yeah, 
before the storm in the equity and the bond market, but perhaps seeing some of those jitters in the FX space, which brings me to this chart that caught my eye. This idea here that you're already seeing some elevated volatility in some of the currency pairs, specifically in euro dollar and, of course, dollar max. And just to put this into a little bit of context of when we saw this last, I'm going to start right here. The last time we saw this much many jitters in dollar max was all the way back to the onset of COVID. And that's really where you see this becoming such a big deal because the largest trading partner onshore for the United States is going to be Mexico. How does that impact some of the trade kind of uh, flows between those two uh, nations, not to mention some of the renegotiations around the USMCA, despite that, of course, being one of the key pillars of the Trump administration 1.0. Take it back to the euro dollar. It's not quite the same story. You are seeing elevated jitters, but you saw similar amounts going into 2022. A lot of that around the Fed pricing, the idea of hikes and how that showed up in the currency market. But since then, in terms of politics, in terms of trade, you haven't actually seen that kind of jitters until, again, going back to March of 2020. So it really speaks, Anna, to this idea that yes, there are jitters. Yes, looks like FX traders are kind of getting ready for some of the volatility we're expecting in the next 72 hours or, show, or so. But at the moment, perhaps not as much as we've seen in prior iterations. Okay, uh, Chrissy, with that really interesting volatility chart then when it comes to FX, let's pick up on the FX conversation. Uh, Mira Chandan, co-head of Global FX Strategy at JP Morgan, on set with us this morning on Election Day to think about where we go from here. Uh, really nice to have you with us, Mira. Let's start with the dollar, and you have some uh, very nice parameters for us this morning. So uh, a red sweep, dollar goes up 5%. A Trump victory, this is all from, from your notes, I hope this yeah, is still yeah. up today. A Trump victory, but with split Congress, the dollar goes up one5 to 2%. And a Harris win, the dollar drops. This is still, this is where the range of movement we're expecting, right? Absolutely. And I think, I think the key issues here are, firstly, um, what is the uh, policy on trade and tariffs? And second is what's the policy on fiscal? And I think that those are the two main channels through which we're thinking about it for FX. And of course, with the red sweep, both of those get activated and sort of extends the shelf life for the dollar. Absolutely. Mm. Okay. And what does it, what, what, what are the, I mean, we were hearing from Critty about the Mexican peso, a lot of people focused on the euro, a lot of people yesterday we were having conversations about small open economies in various parts of the world, yes. which in a sort of aggressive trade tariff environment might not do very well. Uh, do you have a sense of what is sold off uh, in exchange for that dollar gain, if we did see a Trump uh, Trump victory? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, the first thing to note is that for tariffs, clearly it's China and Europe um, that are really front and center of that whole argument. And um, so uh, dollar CNH um, mm -hmm. is substantially higher, but of course that's managed currency, so it will unfold in a sort of a policy-driven way, so to speak, so more controlled. Uh, also, we know that China has already lined up the fiscal uh, response, potentially. They have the NBC meeting going on right now. So based on the outcome of the elections, can fine-tune what the size of the overall fiscal package will be. So that is, in a way, uh, a backstop or a floor on China assets in reaction to a possible Trump outcome. Um, a Europe, a Europe Eurozone is, I think, I think a you know, slightly different story where there is no such fiscal package or anything like that in the offing. So at the end of the day, any kind of policy heavy lifting is going to have to be done by the ECB. So mm -hmm. I think the question of whether the terminal rate that the market is pricing for ECB right now at 2% gets called into question. I think the markets will have to pricing in a lot more um, easing for the ECB. And then beyond that, I think for commodity currencies, in 2018, 2019, when we did get the tariffs put on, it was commodity currencies like Brazil, Colombia, uh, Chile, uh, you know, Sweden, small open economies, uh, heavily dependent on manufacturing that weakened the most. So we kind of expect okay. the same paint book. Well, so, so let's just talk about the euro in more specific terms. It feels very binary in terms of Trump, yeah. Harris. Yeah. I, just give us the kind of sense of the range of movement that we could see. Trump, Trump wins... Where do we trade on euro? Like we're at kind of circa 109 now. Do we go back towards parity? Do we stay static roughly where we are now under a Harris win with a kind of gridlock story in Congress? Kind of just give us the parameters there. Right. So Harris is the status quo outcome uh, for markets. However, we shouldn't view this... Uh, it's a status quo for policy, not necessarily for markets, because uh, if she becomes president, then you take out a major tail risk uh, yeah. on tariffs and, um, and trade policy right away. Um, so for markets, it should mean that we should settle uh, at a higher level for both CNH and euro, just purely because that downside right. risk has been taken out. So, uh, level in, means. Uh, so, so I would say uh, our targets for euro dollar are 113 to 115 in the Harris outcome with the split Congress. So we make a new high in the euro over yep. and above the 112 that we had once the trade uncertainty is taken out for a little while. It might eventually be a trap.
but yep. none of the structural problems in Europe and China get fixed with, with the Harris outcome. In the case of Trump, I think it depends on whether it's a split Congress or whether it's a red sweep. For the split Congress, uh, in either scenario, you have the tariff risk activated. So it should be euro weaker towards 105, let's call it, um, yep. in a split Congress, because only the tariff part of it is activated. But um, if you're talking about a red sweep, then you could actually have a situation where U.S. interest rates are higher because we might have the fiscal more fiscal easing yep. in the U.S. as well, which sort of gives you a double whammy, and then that's what could be um, needed to get euro dollar towards parity. So we're looking parity in a red sweep, um, 105 on euro dollar with um, Trump and the split Congress. And the yen? Yen, um, I think less so about tariffs, more so about what U.S. rates do and hence fiscal policy. So look for dollar yen to sort of uh, retest the 155, possibly 160 if it's a red sweep, because that's the scenario which gives you higher U.S. rates. Yep. Um, but at that point, I think two things will happen. Firstly, um, we might get the FX intervention risk again from the Ministry of Finance in Japan. Yep. And secondly, I think it becomes greater likelihood that BOJ will actually give us a 25 basis point hike in December. So I think as fiscal policy becomes more activist in the U.S., the BOJ and Japan policy also becomes more activist. Right. So it's correlated in a way. But if it's, of course, if it's a hardest outcome or U.S. rates don't rise so much, then I think dollar yen can come back down on the back of that because U.S. rates would be lower. Yeah. I want to revisit the scenario of a democratic sweep and, and or even a Harris administration where you say that uh, some, a lot of this depends on the fiscal policy. Isn't there kind of a status quo bullish almost tailwind for the dollar given that the deficit's going to rise regardless of the candidate? Yeah, I think um, I think regardless, if there's a sweep regardless of the candidate, we should see the deficits, um, deficits rise. But even if there's gridlock, should uh, it? But yeah, I, th and that's the issue behind the dollar. I think to a large extent you have a variety of tailwinds there. You've got more willingness and ability to use their fiscal response. You've got an economy that's facing, you know, that's experiencing a high a boost in productivity. You've had as a result of that um, growth, um, pretty substantial growth, um, you know, tailwinds compared to China and Europe. And you've got an equity market that's obviously, you know, relying on innovation and ongoing outperformance relative to the rest of the world. So I think none of those things get severely yeah. hampered by the outcome of this election, really. So if, in my mind, um, even if we do get the Harris outcome with the split Congress, um, you know, the U.S. exceptionalism story doesn't really get dented from the medium term. You might see a short-term pause in it, but I think it will be a two- to three-month phenomenon before which we're talking about U.S. growth resilience again and how yeah. the Fed needs to be high for long. So we had a guest on yesterday's program talk to us about this kind of weakness in the euro that's almost assumed off of that dollar strength. And he said that the tailwinds that you might, or I guess the pain that you might see in things like Scandinavian currencies or Eastern European currencies would create capital flows into the euro and help kind of cushion it from some more of that weakness that you would get under the dollar. Do you buy that argument? Um, not, not really. I think the, it depends on what's driving that weakness. If the weakness is being driven by... So all of the countries that you mentioned, are, including the euro, are heavily dependent on manufacturing. And if you get um, global tariffs, that is targeting manufacturing. So it should penalize these economies more and these currencies more. So why would the capital be flowing into these economies yeah. if... Um, you know, if, if there is this underlying question marks around uh, the longevity of these cycles. Also, I mean, let's not forget, under Trump, there is also the argument being made that the geopolitics in the recent region actually worsens. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I don't necessarily buy that argument. In fact, I would say that the ability of the euro um, zone to sort of counteract any tariff impact is uh, the composition is very different from China and actually almost lends itself to more euro weakness because monetary policy is going to have to do the heavy lifting. EC, ECB will have to do ease more as opposed to China where there's way more fiscal response. Your, Eurozone doesn't have that. A fascinating 24 hours for you. Absolutely. Well, I'm sure. Mary Chandler, <laughs> co-head of Global FX Strategy over at JP Morgan, joining us around the table. And again, road mapping some of the scenarios around much of the world. We thank you so much. Coming up on the program, we're going to be speaking to the chairman of Commodities Trading House, Gunvor, about his concerns about the Middle East and slowing demand from China. That conversation next. This is Bloomberg.
43 minutes past the hour. Welcome back. Let's talk about the giant Saudi oil company Aramco. Out with numbers, Q3 numbers this morning. Two numbers really stand out in terms of the figures that they've delivered this morning. Q3 net income coming through at 97.62 billion. That's light. 99.74 was the estimate. Yet despite this... Total dividends, 31.05. And this is the tension that is increasingly existing within this company and tells you a lot about what is happening with Saudi and its efforts to revite or, or to change, to sort of re-engineer its economy. It needs the dividend from Aramco to do that. That is why that Aramco dividend is stable, yet... The finances behind it are starting to look more and more stretched. And it's going to be interesting, Anna, at some point that mm. tension is going to become more evident, but not yet. Yeah, dividend yield matters to lots of investors, the Saudi government amongst them. Uh, let's continue the theme of energy markets. Let's get more on what's uh, on the minds of some of the world's top oil and other energy executives. Bloomberg Horizons Middle East anchor and Africa anchor uh, Jumana Basetja is at the ADIPEC conference in Abu Dhabi. Good morning, Jumana. Well, good morning, guys. Yeah, it's interesting to hear you pick up on Aramco and some of the headwinds facing the company. They, they, they pointed down to lower refining margins, but also lower oil prices and the fact that they have been reducing their output over the last couple of years. So that's clearly having an impact on Aramco earnings. But to further the discussion on all things oil and macro, I'm really happy to say that the Gunvor chairman at Torbjörn Swampfest joins me now. It's great to have you with us on the sidelines of Adipak. Um, just to bring it back to the discussion that we were having, around Aramco, but also just OPEC plus decision making. Uh, they decided on Sunday to push back the decision to bring extra oils back to the market. Obviously some concern about the macro dynamics here, specifically when you're looking at demand, but then also non-OPEC supply that's coming. It feels to me as though the setup in the short term for oil is quite bearish. What's your view? Yes, I think uh, I agree. I think it was a wise decision of OPEC not to add any more oil because we see the balances are getting in favor of a little bit too much supply. Demand hasn't really been there, what we expected earlier in this year. So I think it was a good decision and, uh, and I think they know what they're doing. When you look at all of these headwinds uh, facing some of the oil producers, what do you see as the fair value for oil right now? Oh, that's a good question. I think uh, I would say it's around seventy dollars today. It's seventy-five because we do have a risk premium, reflecting the tension and the uncertainty we have right now in the in the situation surrounding Iran and Israel. Mm. So I would say so, around seventy or so. Without that, prices will be probably be a little bit lower, and that was OPEC also understood. It was not time to add. As chairman of a physical trading house, I'm very interested to see and some of the signals that you're getting through coming from China uh, obviously has been a major factor of discussion when you think about some of the drivers for oil demand looking ahead. The authorities have been trying to stimulate the economy. What are the signals that you're getting right now from the Chinese economy? Well, China's economy is struggling. And, uh, and I think as a, as a result, the oil demand is not growing as we used to be. But it's an, uh, another factor much more important. China is on a, on a policy of changing their energy system. 50% uh, of uh, cars sold today are EVs. Trucks are being fueled by LNG and gas. The reality is that for the main driving, uh, uh, the main transportation fuels, there is no demand growth. It's all coming from uh, other aspects uh, for the petrochemical sector and feedstocks. So yes, this is, uh, this is something of a new situation. Yeah. I was speaking to the Indian energy minister yesterday, and one of the numbers that I put to him was a forecast put forward by OPEC, suggesting that by 2050, it will be India as the dominant drive, is the dominant driving seat for energy demand. Three times as much energy demand growth is expected to come from India than from China in the next 20 years. Do you see that increasingly happen as well? And is that going to affect the way you think about your trading around the world? Mm. He may very well be right. I think China is going to continue. Uh, I do believe that we've seen some kind of plateau in the, in the growth of traditional oil in, uh, in China. India is in a different stage and it's growing fast. And I think the world would look at India as the driver of uh, uh, oil demand for the future. U.S. elections happening today. It's obviously a big focus of discussion uh, for every industry around the world, but particularly the oil industry as well. Do, do you have a, a feel either way on what a President Harris or what a President Trump could mean for 
for the direction of travel for the energy industry. Does it really matter in the long run who's president? Uh, I think it do to some extent. I think it's. Um, I think the uh, Trump administration will be more favorably inclined to further develop uh, U.S. Uh, oil and gas industry. Yes. Yeah. And so, does that translate to sustainability efforts? Obviously, here at Adipec, over the years, the discourse has has varied. Last year, we were talking about the energy trilemma: sustainability, energy security, energy affordability was one of the themes. It feels as though this year. The focus has sort of pivoted to looking ahead uh, at the new sources of energy demand and where the energy sources are going to come from, which means hydrocarbons may actually be with us for, for longer than we had anticipated in the past. I, I do think so. I do think so. Energy transition is happening. Uh, make no mistakes about that. But so is also energy demand. It's growing. So we need both. We need a transition. We need new form of, uh, of energy. But oil still, 20 years from now, play a very dominant role. And I think the task of the industry is to clean up its use. And technologies are now being developed. And that thinks, I think that oil will have a very important role to um, uh, you know, fulfill in the energy mix going forward, yeah. clearly. Yeah. We're going to have to leave it there. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, mm -hmm. Guys, that was the Gunver Chairman, Torben Togvist, uh, joining us on the sidelines of Adipac, talking through all things macro, but also those all important U.S. elections and how they may affect the industry as well. Jimana, thank you. Bloomberg's Jimana Bersetcher on the ground there at that Adipec conference. Let's pivot uh, to the broader macro themes then as we wait for the U.S. election to get fully into gear. Our Markets Live executive editor, Mark Cudmore, is with us. And Mark, I look around and I see lots of calm. I suppose that's to be expected on a day um, where, which is going to be so uh, decisive. The Markets Live team reminds me this morning that stocks have a habit of ending election years in positive mood just simply because you've moved through a, a potential risk event. What are you thinking this election day? Yeah, and I, and I think the macro tailwinds are still there for stocks. They're not as strong as they've been all year. I think some of them are fading a little bit. But I think the backdrop is, is still good for stocks, never mind the election. The other thing that's really confusing me is that it, the vast majority of people I talk to in the market seem to think that it's more likely Trump wins. I'm not saying high conviction, but that's the way they're biased. And the second bit is they seem to think that, that if Trump wins, there'll be a much bigger reaction in markets and yet they don't seem to have that position on. And you, you ask all these people, say, what's your expected distribution of outcomes? And for most people, it, you know, it's Harris, it's much smaller move. Trump, it's very large moves. And yet they think Trump's more likely. Well, just waiting, you know, do an expected probability of outcomes then, and you suddenly yep. get a, 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 a distribution which looks very favorable towards higher dollars towards the end of the week, higher equities, higher gold, higher Bitcoin, betting that way on a risk-reward basis, regardless of what the outcome happens. What happens if we don't get a result, Mark, quickly? H how do we work our way through the next few hours? H how's the market going to cope with that? So I think there's two things we need to del del delineate here. One is that we don't have an official result, but we kind of know what the result is. I take to 2020, we knew what the result was the next day in Asia. We knew within 24 hours. It wasn't official till four days later because of, you know, recounting and challenges, but we knew which way it was going to be. And so I think that's the expectation, is that we're unlikely to have complete lack of clarity. There might be legal challenges, but we know which way the electoral votes are kind of weighing down. Uh, in that case, we play the kind of outcome. If it is genuinely uncertain, i.e. we're really closely challenging, say, Pennsylvania, where it comes down to like a 1,000 votes or something, and we need to challenge that... I think that's going to be really, really tough for markets and a proper risk off. But I think the, the, that scenario is very, very low probability. Well, let's talk a little bit about your, your wheelhouse as well, which is the emerging market story, specifically the FX. We talk a lot about the uh, kind of increased volatility in the yuan, the Mexican peso, among others. What EM currency is perhaps the most at risk right now in terms of weakness? I think the perception out there is that if Trump wins, they're going to pick on the Mexican pace even more. It's had a pretty bad period, though, so I wonder whether we're quite far through that trade. I think targeting the yuan is, 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 is people's going to be knee-jerk. But remember, you've got the PBOC on the other side, and the mood is getting much more positive about China. Uh, so I think it's going to be harder to challenge that, particularly in Asia. The one I think is most interesting is Brazilian real, because that's been hit really badly recently. But in fact, it's more of a China play than a US play, and it will really benefit from a better risk-on mood if that comes.
All right. Bloomberg's Marcus Live executive editor Mark Cudmore joining us around, uh, well, from Singapore, actually. I was going to say around the table. He, I'm sure he at some point will join us around the table. You get more analysis from him and the team, just type in MLIVGO on your Bloomberg terminal. I mean, it's, it's going to be fascinating. 72 hours and counting, potentially, mm -hmm. on, on how long this lasts. But essentially, you're already seeing some of those jitters show up in the FX space, as, as Mark pointed out, specifically in the peso. Yeah, it'll be really interesting, even if it takes uh, days, maybe, you know, maybe even longer to get official results, how quickly do market players say, that's it, I have enough information, I'm going with this, regardless yep. of what anybody formal is saying, or even whether any media networks have called the result. Uh, there are some individual stocks that could be on the move, Carrefour could be on the move, yep. Scheffler could be on the move, Salt Skitter, you pointed out as well, uh, that could be a big mover, actually, shareholders considering submitting a takeover bid on that one. Vodafone could be on the move as well, looks like the regulators may be taking a uh, more positive view in terms of the three deals, so we'll keep an eye on what is happening there. Yeah, Salt Skitter, potentially shareholders coming in and making an offer for the company. That stock could be sharply, sharply higher this morning. Indexes, though, probably sitting on their hands, waiting to see whether or not the US election delivers the results that we're set up for or not. What are we set up for? I think there's a lot of ambiguity in the market this morning. Uh, I think everybody's going to be taking a very deep breath. We'll see the market open next. This is Bloomberg. November the 5th, election day in America. Equity markets, I suspect, are going to sit on their hands, certainly at an index level. What is the story coming out of yesterday? Well, actually, not much. Uh, a little bit of a tick higher after the European close in the U.S. equity market session. I think you've probably also got to factor in a little bit of China this morning and a more positive picture maybe emerging from the Kaishin there. That's a factor maybe that could impact the FTSE. But it's interesting, Critty, the FTSE's actually called a little lower this morning. It is bound by about one tenth of one percent. It's the same margin that you're seeing the outperformance in Europe as well. But again, it's not that much of a move, not the kind of momentum that we've seen in previous iterations. A lot of this may just be a sum of, of all parts. The CAC of 40 futures are seeing slight outperformance, but again, emphasis on slight and only higher. I will call it two tenths of one percent. I'm being generous there. Uh, yeah, really not much movement pricing right now is there for the start of the European Trading Day. Feels like a day where we are waiting for events elsewhere to unfold. And some of that voting, as we know, has gone underway already. We will watch uh, for, for, for all of the twists and turns of the uh, 24 hours ahead. Let's go to some of the stocks in focus this morning. Car 4 could be on the move. Uh, it, we understand at Bloomberg that they're studying options to increase the valuation. What does that mean for the share price? Uh, Scheffler in focus, the maker of parts for cars, cutting 4,700 jobs in Germany, closing two sites. So that's going to be one we're watching. It doesn't look as if we're expecting too much movement in the share price at the start of trade, but it could be uh, something of a mover. And Salt's Gitter in focus as well. Shareholders there considering submitting a takeover bid, so that could be something we watch. Guy, as you were mentioning, iron ore, copper, uh, other metals on the rise as a result of some of that China news flow uh, that we've seen overnight, some of that services, even on the back of the services number, yep. uh, so that could push some of the mining stocks a little higher. Yeah, all of this, though, I suspect, Anna, is going to fall foul of the idea that actually there's a bigger story, and that's the U.S. election. So single stocks, you may get a little bit of movement. Salt Skidder could certainly be one of those. So here's the opening trade. Let's talk about the numbers. Could take a little while to get Germany open this morning. But the FTSE is out of the gate, a little soft already, but not down by much. The next few hours could be really volatile. I mean, the next 24, 48 hours could be really volatile. How much positioning is there really in the market? Either way, I suspect a lot of people have got their books fairly neutral. Are equities going to be the beneficiary regardless of who wins? That's a tough call to make maybe at this stage. So European equities this morning, very flat. You can see it already on the screen. The stock 600 barely budging. The FTSE's down by less than one-tenth uh, of one percent. The CAC's up a little bit, but not by much. The IBEX is open, down by two-tenths of one percent. I think we're going to have to wait a little while for the DAX to get going this morning, uh, but I suspect probably signalling something similar. But some single stocks could be quite interesting. So let's talk about the sector story. Let's talk about the single stock story. Critty, what are we seeing? Well, tech seems to be on the back foot this morning. When you look at the index contribution from it, the biggest waste that you're seeing, I'm seeing ASML take a little bit of a, of a hit here this morning, uh, Schneider Electric as well, Anna, but alongside some of the actually renewables makers, and so that's going to be more of an uh, earnings story. Orsted, for example, Vest is certainly in focus. We'll get those uh, quoted for you in just a few minutes. But we are seeing outperformance, on the other hand, in France, as Guy mentioned, and a lot of that is led by luxury. So again, it seems to be the story between luxury and tech, both heavyweights, 
both opposite trades this morning. Mm, yeah, in terms of that renewable energy story, then we do see considerable weakness in the Vestas share price down by 4.5% this morning. There was at the EBIT margin level that slight downgrade to what they expect to achieve there. So that's certainly something we're watching. Orsted also out with uh, numbers in that sector and that, so uh, that stock down by one3 percent. Um, so we continue to watch that sector and we'll have a conversation with uh, the management of Vestas a little bit later on in the programme. In terms of the other movers then, Chrissy, you've been through some of the uh, some of the sectors that are on the move this morning. We're waiting for some of the individual stocks that we put in focus this morning to actually open up. Some of those have not opened. Uh, but yeah, basic resources, the best performing sector on the back of uh, some of that China news flow, it would seem. Yeah, I'm waiting for a start to get a share price that mm. I think could take some time to get going. Looks like we could see a significant amount of movement in that stock. We'll get Vestas very shortly. That is certainly going to be one of the companies that could be affected by what happens in the United States in terms of policy regarding offshore wind in particular. But European stocks certainly watching very carefully what happens over in the United States. Tariffs has been a story for European investors as they watch what could come out of this. What have the presidential candidates been saying about this? Let's take a listen. Tariff. 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 I am a tariff man. To me, the most beautiful word in the dictionary is tariff. The Trump administration resulted in a trade deficit, one of the highest we've ever seen in the history of America. He invited trade wars. I want to cut taxes on Americans while putting tariffs on China and foreign countries. Focusing on relationships with our allies, focusing on investing in American-based technology. Build your plant in the United States and you don't have any tariffs. Okay. Tariffs are on the agenda. Emmanuel Kao, head of European Equity Strategy at Barclays, joining us now around the table. Is that tariff story priced? I think it is partly priced, Guy. Uh, we've seen a, a bit of discrimination in the market over the past few months on the expectation Trump will be winning. So there's a lot of pre-positioning in the market on the back of this kind of expected Trump win. And some of that is reflected in the underperformance of, of European equities, Asian equities, Mexican equities. And within Europe, we have a basket of tariff uh, names, which has been underperforming by 15 percent over, over the past three or four months. So, yes, I think the market is quite worried, quite nervous about the names yeah. that will be impacted by those tariffs. So if I want to, if, if Harris looks like she's going to win, if we're going to see a, a Harris presidency, do I buy those stocks? Is that the first and most obvious trade that I should be looking at? I would think so. I think the asymmetry, I think tactically, is, more, is a bit more in favour of Harris trades. Uh, in a sense, that the market is quite long Trump, even though some of it has been reversed in the last few days. But yes, tariff names uh, in the cyclical space in particular, in Europe, stock exposed to China, are the names that could bounce um, first if you have a clear outcome tomorrow. Mm. Uh, Emmanuel, I'm interested in your sense of uh, how much we have seen pricing out of Trump trades in recent days. Have we seen much? I was reading in a different asset class entirely. I was reading somebody's research on what we saw on bond markets and the yield story there and saying actually the fact that we saw yields go up you know, on Friday, but then only came down to 4.3% or so, was suggesting to this bond analyst that maybe actually it wasn't really all about Trump in the first place. There was something else in the mix as well. I mean, to what extent do you think we ha have seen pricing out of Trump trades? I don't think we've seen much. I mean, clearly there are a lot of factors in play. We've seen, on top of Trump being priced in, stronger data in the US, driving this reflationary uh, mm. impulse in the market. Uh, and look, in the last couple of days, we had this uh, betting odds which the market has been following closely over the last few months, somewhat narrowing again in favor of Harris. So the market was very comfortable with Trump winning as a base case. And obviously, in the last couple of days, betting odds are shifting towards Harris again. So the market is just following that, right? Mm. So we've seen rates going down a bit, dollar coming down a bit. We've seen some of these reflationary winners taking a bit of a back set. But definitely, market I think is still positioned for this reflationary yeah impulse that would come with a Trump win. And as we said, I think the tariff name and stocks outside the US are still lagging significantly. Uh, do we need to, in terms of how much discount, if we get a Trump win, uh, when we're thinking about the discount that Europe should trade at, does this depend on whether there's a red sweep or is that aside from the red sweep? What should we watch for to assess the level of Europe discount that should apply under a Trump presidency? Well, I don't think the, the Congress matters so much for Europe because what matters a lot for Europe is tariff and tariff can be enacted even without uh, a red sweep, right? So I think for, for the US, if you have a red sweep, that's maybe a, a more favorable outcome because you can get this reflationary policies, these tax cuts, 
this yep. deregulation to offset some of the tariff impact. On Europe, you won't get that. You would get the full hit from tariff, uh, assuming they are enacted, assuming it's not just negotiation tactics, and we won't know for some time, right? So I think the, the market will be quite worried about, um, you know, buying the deep in some of these dams if Trump is indeed uh, the winner tomorrow. It feels like so much of the read-through from this election is through the lens of tariff policy. And I'm curious how much of it maybe should be the lens, through the lens of deficit, tax changes, et cetera, especially to European multinationals like LVMH, ASML. I know you can't speak to individual names, but when it comes to some of these heavyweights that are driving the European index, aren't they extremely exposed to domestic policy in the United States? Yes, obviously some of that is true. Um, I mean, I guess uh, if you look at, at the U.S., and that's why I think the color of the Congress or the um, direction of the Congress will matter a lot because um, you could have significant um, uh, reflationary package with tax cut and deregulation, which will be quite bullish, I think, for a number of uh, U.S. domiciled companies. Some of the names uh, listed in Europe exposed to the U.S. could benefit as well. And you could even believe that if the U.S. consumer ultimately get the boost from this tax cut and, uh, you know, reflationary uh, policies that might help, uh, you know, businesses or uh, demand for some of these exposed names uh, we have in Europe. But I think in the grand scheme of things, trade is still the main issue. A lot of stocks in Europe are global cycle plays. They care about demand in China. They care about, you know, global demand. And I guess if you see trade uh, issues uh, and constraint, I think that would be another drag on some of these names. Uh, Obviously, Chinese outlook is quite important as well. You know, there's a lot of focus yeah. on U.S. policies, but in the background, we are seeing some early signs of stabilization in, in U.S. in Chinese data. So something to watch as well. But as you said, I think tariffs are the main discriminant factors for, for the trade in Europe. Well, you bring up China, and, and one of the crucial pieces we've been talking about around the show has just been when we look at some of the policies come out of China, what does European policy look like in response to some of that that could then more directly affect the regional stocks? And I'm curious, in the context, again, of the U.S. election, what are there any European policy changes that could come to the forefront in response to, to the United States that may change the game for, say, French tech, for example? Well, I think, I think the big issue is that you get some retaliation against U.S. tariff. Uh, and again, we won't know for some time. Uh, if you think about the 10% tariff impact on earnings, on growth, is very minimal. But if you think about a broad, uh, you know, scale, a larger trade war that would get China, that would get uh, Europe to retaliate against U.S. tariff, and that's why you can get a significant hit to growth, what right? What sectors would, would that fall under, though? Well, I would say, you know, pretty much everything in cyclicals. But if you think about some of the consumer names, the tech names, some of the industrials, that's where I think you would get a significant hit. You know, these things are global trade players. Uh, they have been benefiting from globalization over the last couple of years. Margins have been very strong. Pricing power has been very strong. Cost has been, you know, maintained relatively low. If you get trade friction uh, more and more, I think that's going to be a hit on profitability. And the valuation will have to reflect some of that. How sensitive are European stocks to higher U.S. yields, which may come with a Trump presidency? Uh, they are quite sensitive, uh, and I think this is something to watch, I would say, first thing tomorrow. Uh, what is the bond market telling us? You know, uh, at face value, you can say Trump uh, policies might be quite reflationary. Uh, deregulation, lower taxes could help, but if this is coming... There's a bit of stress in the bond market. I'm not sure the equity market mm. will like it. And definitely in the last couple of weeks, we've seen even in Europe, bond yields moving higher in sympathy with the move higher we saw in the U.S. bond market, in U.S. yields as well, right? So if you see a broad risk off in rates on the back of this you know, fiscal indiscipline that the market is getting worried about, look at the U.K. budget last week. I think that might create a bit of stress across markets. OK. How are you preparing then, uh, Emmanuel? How are you preparing for the next, well, is it 24 hours, 48 hours, the next week, the next two months? You know, you tell me. Uh, it, what is the sense? What, what is the, where's the... the uh, the focus of activity going to be? I mean, clearly you can't take your eyes off anything that happens in the next 24 hours, I suppose, when it comes to the election results. But do you have a sense at Barclays as to when you're preparing to know something material? So our plan is to go to bed early tonight and to wake up early tomorrow morning <laughs> yep. and see what happens. Uh, and that's that's like, every day for This us. is a good plan. <laughs> <laughs> nothing unusual, but maybe a bit earlier than, than, than usual tomorrow morning. Look, I think what we want to find out tomorrow is whether you have a clear winner uh, and, and the process to get very smooth. If you have a disputed election or very, very narrow between yeah. the two candidates, I think it's going to take a bit of 
uh, maybe stress in the market. To get there, you know, think about 2000, where back then, you know, a long time ago, but, you know, there was a very narrow gap between Bush and Algo, and it took a month yeah. for those votes to be recounted, and the market was on 10%. There was a proper risk of, right? So I don't think this is the base case we have now, but if the polls are right, and polls are very, very tight, I would expect the uncertainty maybe to last a few more days. Look, ultimately, I think the election will, or might be acting as a clearing event. You know, what you want is some certainty. You want to know who is going to be in charge in the U.S. for the next four years. And once you find out, you know what to expect. You know, where to invest, and that could uh, somewhat unleash animal spirit. How do you get there is a question, and I suspect the market will wait to see some clarity on that before taking strong views and strong positions. In terms of, you mentioned that volatility as well around the, uh, around the disputed election, but what if there isn't a disputed election, but there is volatility in terms of domestic violence or something like that? Is that something that the markets may be sensitive to? Well, look, we had some of that uh, four years ago, right? And ultimately, I think the market did not buy into this um, uh, threat that Trump was making. Uh, so I think if the result is pretty clear and should not be disputed, yes, you may have some unrest here and there, when I think the market will probably focus on the fact that you have a clear outcome, and yes, it might take a few more days for stability to come back, but ultimately, from a policy standpoint, you know what to expect, right? Uh, so I think that's what the market wants yeah. some clarity and certainty on the policy setup for the next four years. An early night for Emmanuel Cow. Nice to see you. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed for joining us this morning. Emmanuel Cow, head of European Equity Strategy, joining us from Barclays. Let's take a look at the core six this morning, see what is moving at the centre of the European equity story. Uh, we're going to get Ferrari numbers a little bit later on today. Keep an eye on what is going to happen there. Broadly, though, we are in risk-off territory, as you can see. LVMH softer, which is interesting given what we've seen out of China this morning. ASML is softer. Schneider is softer this morning, down by seven-tenths of one percent. A little bit of safety maybe in Nestle, but look at no down 1% as well. We look forward to its numbers. Single stocks, there are a few that are moving this morning. Joe Easton has the details. Shares are moving Cara 4 this morning over in France. Now remember, a Bloomberg exclusive overnight saying that the company is looking at potential ways to boost its valuation. Now this could potentially include selling some real estate assets, potentially even entering new partnerships with other retailers, according to the report as well. So plenty of options and even the other final option of big M&A. But bear in mind, a deal with another French retailer was blocked by the French government around three years ago. So potentially that is meaning the gains are contained. We're up 1.9% at the moment for that one. The other big M&A story that you guys were mentioning earlier is Southskits are now up 25% for this still make much more in the mid-cap space over in Germany, worth around a billion euros, but potentially one of their investors looking to do a full takeover if they can get enough other shareholders on board with their plans, according to a report on that one. So a big gain for Southgitza today. Then over in renewables, this space actually looking pretty weak this morning. We had a couple of reports out. Vestas down another 8%. Now, bear in mind that stock has already come off quite a lot already over the past year or so. Weak earnings in terms of their guidance at the lower end. We've also had numbers from Allstead. Those were looking pretty steady, but potentially the Vestas numbers weighing across the entire sector. We see we've got Siemens Energy on the screen as well. That stock's done really well, but potentially, as I say, Vestas weighing on that sector this morning with those weaker than expected margin numbers. Then in terms of the other earnings, one stock really standing out to me was Schroeder's down 12%. At the moment, now that is the biggest decline since the pandemic days of 2020. Now they have seen around two billion pounds worth of outflows in the latest period. And analysts ahead of the report were saying we might have actually seen an inflection because of the changing political scene in the UK, but we haven't seen that. And a real shock for Schroeder's share price today, down 12% at the moment. In terms of the apparel retailer Primark holding up pretty well over at AB Foods, and Hugo Boss actually did see an 8% decline in their Asia sales in the last period, kind of in line, though, with what we've already seen from the luxury space, so potentially priced in for that one. And finally, down the bottom in medical tech, Ambu over in Denmark once again. That one hit a serious series of profit warnings from the Danish medical tech firm coming down almost 15% this morning. Then quickly on the morning calls, we got a couple in the aviation space today. This one was standing out. Air France down to underweight over at Morgan Stanley today. That one coming down 2.5%. They're citing rising debt and weaker cash flow at Air France, according to the firm. And then finally, Ryanair, we did see a little bit of a decline in that stock 
yesterday. I did think potentially the news around the Boeing strikes would be a positive for this company today. But we got Peel Hunt cutting the stock, cutting it down at two hold. That one falling at 1%, falling a Peel Hunt downgrade. They are citing a rising fuel for Ryanair. So getting another hit on that stock in Dublin this morning. Joe, thank you very much. Joe Easton with a briefing. Uh, all the equities in focus. Uh, big picture stories, but also the individual names cutting through this morning. Uh, there aren't many of them, but there are some, as he's just been through. 8.16 here in London, Election Day in the United States. That, of course, is the big picture narrative that hangs over all of the market moves. Uh, we'll get back to another important story that really does link up with the politics, though. Uh, a breakthrough for Boeing's new CEO as striking workers vote to accept the latest pay offer. We'll look at what the future holds for the... Uh, uh, U.S. aircraft maker. That conversation is next. This is Big Bang. secured a victory. They voted by 59% to accept the agreement and they get to move forward. The strike will end and now it's our job to get back to work and start building the airplanes, increase the rates and uh, bring this company back to financial success. Boeing union leader John Holden a few hours ago announcing the end of this long-running strike. 33,000 workers have been out on the picket lines for weeks but last night they voted to accept the latest pay offer from Boeing. Let's talk more about what is happening here. We're joined by Bloomberg's Global Aviation editorial leader, Benedict Camel. Benny, let's talk about what has just happened. We get a result, we get a positive result, the workers go back onto the line, but how long does it take to get this company back up and running? How long does it take to get the Boeing plants up and running? More critically, how long does it take to get the supply chain up and running as well? Yeah, I mean, all of that's going to take quite a long time. We're talking months and not days or weeks. Um, you know, the CEO, Kelly Ortberg, said a couple of weeks ago, it's much easier to turn the switch off than to t turn it back on. So that's going to be the crucial part now. You know, all the workers have been uh, off work for more than 50 days. As you said, the supply chain is disrupted by this. Production has come to a standstill. The only planes that they have been producing are in South Carolina. That's a 787 Dreamliner plane. And they've been making about four planes of, of, of that particular model uh, in a month. So uh, if you think about it, um, you know, this is a company with tens of thousands of employees and workers making four planes a month. So they have to get that back up again. And that was very much sort of the tenor uh, from Holden that we just heard, <coughs> that we just heard, excuse me, and from uh, also the company saying we need to get things back up. You know, this is so crucial uh, for morale, uh, for production, uh, for the customers and not least for finances. So that's yeah. really the, uh, the path forward for the company. Holden talks about getting the increase in rates and bringing this company back to financial success. 59% of the, the union voted for this deal. 40% didn't, effectively. Benny, this is a company that has really suffered from culture recently, and I'm wondering whether or not this is a big enough number to signal that actually the entire workforce is behind this deal. Because this is a company that needs to get everybody behind it. It needs to get everybody on board. It needs to get this company moving forward. And everybody needs to be on board with that. Does this result signal that? Uh, in a word, it doesn't. You know, it's, it's what they needed to get it over the line. And I think there was a general sense of weariness. I think uh, the company and the workers and the political field, everyone felt we need a deal. But as you say, 59%, it's not a resounding victory. It's sort of the, the lowest possible almost that they could have gotten. Um, if you think about it, when they came into this, they had more than 90% turned down the initial offer. Then they had about 60-something percent uh, turn it down. So we've, we've moved here, but not far enough probably probably, to really get everyone back on board. Uh, my colleague, Julie Johnson, she was on the scene when the votes were counted, when the uh, results were announced, and she said there was booing uh, in, in the room. People were not happy about this. There's a lot of pent-up anger still at the company. There's a sense that for the last decade that workers got shortchanged while management uh, got, you know, quite handily paid. So there's that cultural divide that still exists at the company, um, and that'll take time to repair. There's a sense that Kelly Ortberg, the CEO, might be the man to get that done. But again, that'll take not days or weeks, it'll be months or possibly even years to get that over the line. 
Well, Benny, so the labor story, of course, one headache for, for Kelly Orpberg. What are the others, what other challenges is he facing long term? Well, they have to get production back up. That's uh, goal number one. They had a, a major announcement last week to repair their finances. So those big blocks are sort of out of the way now. Um, at least there's, there's a sort of path forward. Um, but then longer term, they have to think about um, how do you deal with a, a new political field that invariably will happen, whoever wins uh, in, in, in the election coming up. Um, they will have to think about uh, in terms of how do we go about the next product. There's a new uh, single aisle plane that they'll have to consider receive and build. Um, where will that be built? Will it be built in the Seattle region? When will that come? What might it cost? What are the kind of products we want to see flow into that? All of those things they need to consider. Um, and, and how do we reshape Boeing going forward? That's another big thing that people are looking at. Is the Boeing that exists today the same that we'll see in five years? Will it still be a company built around civil, and, uh, civil aviation, around defense, around space? Some people say that space might be the weakest link here. So all of those things mm. Kelly Altberg needs to think about. And um, we will probably see a very different Boeing in a couple of years than we see now. Uh, uh, but they escaped the worst outcome, I suppose, which would have been that downgrade to the credit rating, Benny. They, they, they got through that, managed that. It took $23 billion in extra capital, but they're through that. Yeah, you're right. That was the big sword that was hanging over them, the, the downgrade into junk territory. They're still just that one step uh, above that. So... It's averted, but, you know, it's bought them some time. But it's not an impossibility that, that it might ha not happen in, you know, in the next couple of months or years even. Um, so for now, they've got that buffer. Um, they've averted the strike. So all signals sort of point to optimism. Um, but they really have mm. to get the production back online. They have to really start building planes again, quite simply, and probably start thinking quite robustly about what the portfolio looks like going forward. Because in the current state, the company is still bleeding cash. And and they will continue to bleed cash next year, and they have to stop that sooner rather than later if they want to keep that credit okay. rating. Benny, thanks very much. Bloomberg's Global Aviation Editorial Leader, uh, Benedict Camel, with the latest on the Boeing story. Uh, coming up on the program, we'll be back with the earnings. Vestas downgrades its uh, EBIT margin guidance, uh, but plenty of interest from the sector in uh, where the uh, winds may blow in today's election, of course. We will talk about renewable energy with the Vestas CEO. This share price really under pressure this morning, down by uh, over 10% right now. We'll get into that conversation next. This is Bloomberg. This is the opening trade. We're 30 minutes in today's session, starting to see a little bit of that maybe marginal positivity get really paired back. But again, very small moves when it comes to these equity indexes across Europe. Uh, the stock 600 down about, we'll call it two tenths of 1%. And I'm, again, being very, very generous. Some outperformance in some parts of the market. The FTSE 100, again, flat at the moment. We'll see how that pans out for the rest of the session. In the meantime, one corporate story that, of course, is catching our eye. Vesta shares have plunged after the wind turbine maker said earnings for the full year will be at the lower end of its guided range. Now, the sector, of course, keeping a close eye on today's U.S. election. Back in May, Donald Trump promised to take aim at offshore wind projects, saying they're bad for birds and whales. Kamala Harris, on the other hand, has been a notable supporter of the sector. Let's bring in Rachel Morrison, who leads Bloomberg's coverage of energy in Europe. Rachel, walk us through kind of these two takes on the wind sector. What are these companies maybe looking for in today's election result? Yeah, there's quite a lot of uncertainty surrounding the um, outcome of, of the election for the sector. So the US is really trying to build its offshore wind industry. And there have been some problems. We saw a really terrible year for the offshore wind industry in the US last year. So onshore has still been a strong area for a lot of the European companies in the US. So looking in the election, there will be kind of looking for signs of what will happen with the IRA, the US tax credit system. Most people expect for that to stay in place no matter who wins. But the extension of that, what happens next, will be very important for these companies as they decide how and when to invest their money in the US. 
Mm. And right back to the here and now, Rachel, we see the Vestas share price under pressure this morning, as I mentioned earlier, uh, down more than 10%. Um, what, what sense do we get from the story they're telling today? What stood out from these numbers? They, they, they seem to be downgrading, but only really at the margin, their EBIT margin. Yeah, exactly. So in the previous earnings, there was a downgrade for one part of the company. And this is more just saying that they expect earnings to be at the lower end of what they already said. So the market reaction has been quite sharp in contrast to what's actually been said. And I think that's because investors are really looking for signs that everything is back to normal, back to growth, and that has been slower and continues to be slower in certain parts of the business, namely the services sector. So it's really a kind of absence of positive news rather than a particularly negative number that's come out of these results today. Rachel, thank you very much indeed. Rachel Morrison, who leads our, leads our coverage of the any sector in Europe, thank you very much indeed, setting us up for the next conversation. We are joined now by the chief executive of Vestas, Henrik Andersen. Henrik, always a pleasure. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. So revenue was ahead of estimates but you've narrowed your EBIT, your operating margin guidance to the lower end of the range. You're getting a really big market reaction, a very negative market reaction to the latter. Do you think that's an overreaction? How big a move really is this in what you're telling us about what is happening next? Yeah, well, for us, uh, we, kept, we kept the full year. I mean, for, for Q3, uh, we are executing on a, on a busy Q3. We came out. 20% more and higher uh, activity than, than last year. A uh, lot of questions were raised uh, after uh, our second quarter, uh, both in terms of the power solution. Are we actually turned the corner on the profitability on power solutions? I think we evidenced that after Q3, uh, where we are now having a four quarter improvement in the power solutions of nearly 500 basis points. And, and everyone can also see with what we have of visibility of the remaining uh, 60 days of this year, that we are coming towards uh, positively towards the end of executing on the lower priced backlog of, of turbine orders, which uh, will help the company uh, perform significant better in the future. We also said here on the service so side, uh, we are not back to the runway of what uh, is expected. So a, a minor uh, adjustment on the service side, and we keep working hard with that uh, business across uh, it. So I will say, mm, actually pretty uh, pretty happy with uh, the busy year quarter and we can see we are making progress again in in q4 which is the real underlying for me is to see that we are progressing in the business areas right now but the fourth quarter is going to have to be sensational to get you to those numbers how good is the fourth quarter going to be uh, Matt tells the story. I mean, uh, we are executing on uh, projects we already know we have and we are fairly advanced in. Of course, always fourth quarter has a, has a degree of uncertainty uh, because the fourth quarter has all of the potential risk of weather and other stuff, which we have had for 25 years. And I think we, we, we're taking, of course, a significant uh, progress in, in, the, in the projects we're executing. And as everyone can see, we will be doing uh, for the first time for a very long time double GT the EBIT percentages in fourth quarter uh, when we uh, when we finish it uh, within uh, within that guidance. And that's what we are we are mm. we are aiming at, and that's what we are executing on, fully committed from the team. Uh, Henrik, you mentioned the services side of things. Some of the analysts going into the numbers today were saying that we'd see a significant improvement in earnings as Vestas makes more money on the service side of the, the, the business. You just said that there are still minor adjustments happening on the services side. So how on track or off track is the services story? Uh, I think it's off track in a sense that we would have liked to reassure people that it's uh, fixed within 90 days and it's not. Uh, we are scrutinizing the business across uh, our uh, operating entities. Um, we are continuing doing that. It performed at EBIT level 16% this uh, quarter. That's disappointing. I won't uh, uh, shy away from that. It's a progress from where we were and also progress from where we uh, aim to be uh, both in, in terms of a full year and, and towards next year. Uh, but it takes time. Uh, we are scrutinizing the business as, as both in the operating model we are also scrutinizing a number of, of areas of parks, wind parks, where we have relationship with customers. Um, so that's that's a normal, I will call it, uh, diligent 
we had a surprise. Personally, I had a surprise when we go back to uh, Q2 and that we have to, uh, to put right again. Still an enormous good business, uh, still a fantastic, uh, valuable business, both for our customers and also for investors mm. and the shareholders. But we have to put it right in, in that sense. What yeah. really uh, uh, Henry, supports it? Yeah, sorry. Okay, sorry. I was just going to pick up on the on the on the capex lines. You, you've you've dropped the capex estimate a little bit as well. I wonder what election assumptions you're making in the United States, or what investment assumptions you're making in the United States when you come up with these capex numbers. I know Kevin's numbers for us is an adjustment of we have 60 days to go of this year. So part of what we now see is that there was something that was in our capex guidance that simply will uh, drop into to next year. So therefore, it's it's more, uh, when you adjust 200 million euros, it's because the year is now so advanced that we are not able to manage to uh, to fulfill that. Uh, that's mainly related to some of the, uh, the ramp up, and it mainly related to some of the tools in and around uh, both our offshore and, and onshore. Uh, but but the ramp up is going, and, and we are seeing that in uh, in both the US onshore and we are seeing that in, in Europe and offshore. Henrik, just to follow up on the U.S. election, of course, I'm, I'm sure you're watching it as keenly as we all are. But so much of, of Vestas has, of course, gotten a lot of benefits from the IRA. There's a real chance that in two months' time, some of those benefits are going to get rolled back. How are you preparing for that possibility? Does that include perhaps investing more in the likes of the U.K., where, of course, the government is far more friendly to those ambitions? Yeah, no, this, this end of the day, it comes down to uh, this is not a hitting, this is not one-liners that makes you uh, put thousands of jobs in, in the individual countries. Uh, my job is not trying to predict an outcome of today. Our job is to make sure that we work both with, well with both sides of, of the chamber and both sides of, of the bipartisan in the U.S. I think uh, history tells a story here, uh, All uh, both parties have for consecutive 30 years prioritized energy capacity build out in the US, whether that was renewable or it was the more traditional uh, energy mix. So for us, we see that continuing. There's no, no indication of that any of the two parties will turn the back to an energy build out. And, and let's not forget that uh, IRA has created build out in both factories and projects, uh, which for many reasons are related to uh, nearly three quarters of the states of, of, of the red color. So our job is not trying to, to go uh, single handed on one, but more to work and, and keep having the market uh, open for positive on the renewable side. Um, and we don't make individual uh, deselection or selection uh, between countries or, or, or switch. Um, if UK wants to progress with the ambitious target, they have 30 gigawatt in 2030, then it needs to be based on tangible uh, projects that are permitted and coming through uh, the pipeline uh, to also create manufacturing jobs. Germany is doing it. If I can mention a higher here, um, Germany is doing it. Uh, they will next year probably fast approaching 10 gigawatt in the onshore yeah. uh, permitting. So I think that's really, really good. Well, Henrik, we look forward to having that conversation with you after the U.S. election. But in the meantime, a quick question on China as well, because there is a though some of the biggest uh, turbine companies there are actually talking about a kind of alliance of sorts. Some are going as far to call it a cartel. In your view, does the wind body need something like that? No, I can. <laughs> well, global number one in, in, in wind. No, we, we, we don't work uh, with that. We, we distance ourselves from that. Uh, customers would there's not any customer in the world that would like to have that conversation and be met with uh, with somebody who says I speak on behalf of cartel so I don't know where the idea comes from we we don't appreciate that uh, we we like to discuss directly with customers and partners on a on a free basis on how to put the the solutions in place so I I sort of say it it, it might work in in part of their world it doesn't work in in the world I'm working in Eric Always appreciate the time. Thank you very much indeed for joining us this Q3. We'll look forward to speaking you, to you when it comes to the fourth quarter. The Vestas CEO, Henrik Andersen. Coming up, as we've just been discussing, it is election day in the USA. We're going to discuss the latest as the Americans head to the polls in person. 
Peter Tribuitz, director of the Felon US Centre at the London School of Economics, is going to be joining us next. This is Bloomberg. There's no question the Trump administration would come back with very tight restrictions on Iran. Uh, in terms of tariffs, you worry that uh, if you go back to a tariffs, you take you back to the 1930s where you have uh, retaliation going on. Uh, it built in, I think, the risk is inflation on the one side and the other uh, a slowing global economy. So, you know, we've gotten used over 30 years to an open global economy with a lot of growth. Yeah. And it would, it would really change the, the boundaries of the global economy. S&P Global Vice Chair Dan Yergin speaking to Bloomberg at the Adipec conference in Dubai. Talking about the U.S. election, it's on everybody's mind today. Market liquidity evaporating, certainly ahead of this huge risk event. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Valerie Titel to talk about what is happening here. Valerie, run us through the scenarios. Uh, yeah, yes, Guy, I read all the research reports so you didn't have to, trying to get a consensus picture across asset classes. Let's start with the best case outcome for equities. It is a clear winner and a clear winner quickly. That would see implied volatility collapse across asset classes and the biggest upside for, for risk assets just as the S&P 500. When it comes to treasuries, a Harris win in a split Congress is seen as the best bull case for a big rally in the treasury market. And then the dollar. The dollar is seen as uh, gaining a lot of momentum on on a Trump win, and if he also, uh, if the Republican Party also sweeps the Congress. Let's flip on and talk about the worst case uh, scenarios here, Guy. Worst case for equities is that we head towards a contested election, that we wake up tomorrow morning, there's still no clear winner, and we might see some legal ramifications uh, come to the fore. Uh, for U.S. Treasuries, we could see a, a big gap higher in yields, a big drop lower in price uh, on a Trump win and a Republican sweep. Uh, for the dollar, uh, the worst case scenario is seen as a Harris win win and a split Congress. Now let's check on how these assets have been trading this morning. We are seeing a grind higher in Treasury yields up two and a half basis points in the 10 year yield. S&P futures uh, treading water and the Bloomberg dollar index is holding on to the losses of yesterday. All right. Bloomberg's Valerie Titel walking us through some of the best and worst case scenarios around this election. Already some jitters, as she points out, in this market. Let's continue the conversation. Peter Trubowitz, director of the Phelan U.S. Center at the London School of Economics, joins us around the table this morning. Peter, a pleasure to have you on the program. Great to be here. I'm tempted to ask you what you're going to be doing tonight, but I think we all know. <laughs> uh, let's start with, I, I feel like we've talked a lot about Trump and, and the risks that he provides. I want to talk about Harris a little bit, specifically in the context of this region and her potential international policy given that this is a woman who has faced a lot of criticism on things like the border immigration but also on this topic of tariffs under the biden administration hasn't made many changes to some of the uh, measures that were instituted under trump and also has never actually been to china is her foreign policy kind of track record a concern or should it be well, I think if, if Harris is elected, their allies and friends, America's allies and friends, will breathe a pretty large sigh of relief. Um, having said that, she's untested. Um, some of the issues you've just raised, you know, uh, generate uncertainty about kind of what she would do on specific issues and so forth. But I think in general what they would expect from a Harris administration is continued American international engagement along the lines of Biden, that she would use a scalpel rather than a sledgehammer when it came to trade and to technology, um, and that she would work collaboratively, collectively with America's allies on issues like Ukraine or the Middle East or policy towards China. Um, so, I mean, I think in general that would be the, you know, the, the sense that she would, she'd move in that direction. Of course, a lot would depend really on how divided the United States is at the end of this out election. I mean, let's say she wins, but she doesn't control the Congress. The Republicans take the Senate. They hold the House. That puts a constraint on her, and she would have less latitude to, to move. And I think no matter which one of them wins... Uh, there'll be pressure inside the United States yeah. to reduce America's kind of emphasis on Ukraine, that there will be a push, a desire to get some type of negotiated settlement there. 
You mentioned the Middle East as well, and, yeah. and this is uh, perhaps what's putting Michigan in play as such a swing state, yeah. given that she's losing some of the vote, especially around the Arab American population there. And I'm curious what that policy may actually look like when we know that Trump has stood and has really spoken about his track record on being tough on Iran, specifically around the assassination of, of General Soleimani. What is uh, President, excuse me, potential president or uh, presidential candidate Harris's kind of counter to that? What is her Middle East policy? I, I'm, we're guessing here and reading tea leaves, but my sense is she would try to pursue the same strategy that Biden has with, uh, you know, at best mixed success in dealing with uh, the situation there. I, I suspect we would see her press very early on to try to get a ceasefire over Gaza. And, um, but I don't think that we would see any kind of fundamental shift in terms of U.S. support for Israel yeah. in the region, um, and that may hurt her in Michigan mm. today. Uh, but thinking about the two candidates and their policy platforms is, is, is going to be something we continue to do uh, over, over yeah. days and, and <clears throat> weeks, well, depending on who, how close we get to a result here, Peter. Um, but in the moment, I'm also thinking about, it's quite amazing that there do seem to be undecideds in this, in this election, <laughs> but we hear talk of them. Yeah. And I wonder how many of them are convinced by what they've heard over the last 25 for hours, we saw both the candidates trying to make uh, uh, well, add celebrity endorsements to what they're doing. So we saw uh, Joe Rogan coming out for Trump, of course. We saw Oprah, I mean, that's no surprise, Oprah, uh, Ricky Martin, uh, Lady Gaga and others appearing for, uh, for Harris. Does that matter now? Is that the deciding factor, these sort of celebrity voices throwing their weight into the ring? I think what both sides are doing is throwing everything against the wall to try to make, you know, to, to pick up that those remaining undecided uh, voters, in general, endorsements don't make a huge difference. So um, it may be that Rogan's, you know, 11th hour endorsement of, of Trump moves some young white male voters uh, to, to come out and vote today. Um, but if you look at the polls, like the Iowa poll that was released over the weekend or the New York Times poll uh, as well, what it's showing in general is that undecided voters are moving towards, um, towards Harris. Having said that, it's worth remembering here that a lot of Americans have already voted. Mm. Yep. So, you know, there's stuff that's baked in here that the undecided voter, like, matters, but what matters also is those tens of millions of Americans who've already cast a ballot based on information that is, you know, a week ago, two weeks ago, in some cases, if you're an overseas voter. Yes, I was going to yeah. say, some of them perhaps around ago. this desk. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Peter, how familiar do I need to be with the 25th Amendment? Is it a vote for Trump, a vote for Vance? Is he going to be capable of seeing through four years? Are we going to see succession becoming an issue potentially halfway through? And is that, has that been a factor in the background behind this election, do you think? I, you know, I, I don't, I mean, perhaps for some voters, you know, if, if the Harris campaign thought that it could really um, move undecided voters and swing voters by stressing his age, I think they would have done it. Yep. Um, and so, um, you know, he doesn't have the healthiest diet, he's overweight and so forth. And He doesn't and, say and, that, but yeah. Yeah but, yeah, but perhaps, you know, I mean, maybe there are some voters who have voted for... Trump and Vance figuring that Vance will end up becoming the president. Would Vance be a different president? How different a president could he potentially be? I think Vance is, um, I mean, Vance has subscribed to many of most, if not all, of Trump's policies or policy agenda, and especially Project 2025. So, um, you know, I think what you could expect is that you would see a version of Trump that is perhaps more consistent. Mm. and less erratic. Um, and, and I think that is a concern to many swing voters, especially Vance's position on women. Mm. Uh, Daniel, we opened this conversation with Daniel Jurgen talking about uh, the open global economy being yeah. at stake, uh, Peter. I mean, I, I've, I'm sure people said that when Trump first went into mm -hmm. power in 2016. Yeah. Is this the same? I think if Donald Trump is elected, it will goose anti-globalist, nationalist sentiment elsewhere around the globe, in Europe and other places as well. If it can happen in the United States, I mean, that he is re-elected, 
after, you know, the four-year break and uh, with a, a policy where he is announcing somewhere between 10 to 20 percent tariffs across the board. And then with respect to China, let's say 60 percent. He's gone as high as 100 percent, but 60 yeah. percent. I mean, that kind of rattles the cages, I mm. think. And I think that there's, if he's elected, there will be a lot of talk in Europe. There already is about the potential for of a, a Trump presidency, of Trump proofing, yeah. of, you know, retaliatory tariffs. China certainly would not take it lying down. They didn't take it lying down the first term, yeah. Trump's first term. So I think what you would see is kind of more deglobalization mm -hmm. that, that, you know, takes place. Very quickly, I'm putting you on the spot here. I think a lot of Europeans and international watchers want to know, does Trump's legal record matter in this election or will it in the next 12 months, given that we're still waiting on sentencing? If Trump is elected, uh, I think one, you know, one implication there is his legal record doesn't matter. I mean, that's one of the, yeah. the implications. And if he's in as president, he's in a position to completely dismantle at least the federal, uh, you know, um, uh, legal actions against him. And I, yeah, I think you have to take him at his word that he would. Um, yep. And um, so if Trump is not elected, <laughs> I think he's got some legal problems ahead of him. Great to see you this morning, Peter. Thanks Good. for setting us up Good so nicely in advance of the election. Peter Trubovitz, director of the Phelan U.S. Centre at the London School of Economics. What are we going to know tomorrow, I guess, mm. is the key question. Are we going to be in a... Uh, do we, will we have a sense of certainty this yes. time tomorrow? I was reminding myself of four years ago, some of the headlines that were moving us around. Threats of legal challenge, yes, weighing on stocks at one point, but then any sense that the blue wave was avoided, as it was in 2020, that was something that, that, that sent stocks higher. So, you know, a lot of volatility ahead, Critty. And lots of volatility ahead, plenty of earnings ahead as well. Yep, and it's oh, off yeah. to Germany. Yes, yeah, sorry, she's looking at me, I'm thinking, what? oh yes, I'm going, yes, exactly, I'm going to speak to the Commerce Bank CEO. That's also coming up tomorrow. Have a good day, everybody. This is Bloomberg.